Today we're talking about objections in the courtroom and I'll be giving you the top 10 most common trial objections that you may or may not have heard of. Objection sustained. No, the witness can't object. Overruled. Sidebar. Guilty. Speculation. Hearsay. Bailiff. Briefcase. Disregard. In my chambers. Stop beaver on the witness. I rest. We could totally be lawyers. Bang. The courtroom really isn't like that. Well, it kinda is. You'll see what I mean. Keep watching. Welcome to Law Venture. My name's Jarrett Stone. If you're watching this video about trial objections, then I highly recommend that you download this cheat sheet with the 21 most common trial objections. There's a breakdown of what you need to be saying whenever you're objecting. There's a breakdown of how you need to respond in case somebody's objecting to you. And it all gets boiled down into one simple cheat sheet that you can take to the courtroom so you're prepared on game day. If you want it, it's free and it's instant. Just go in the description, click on the link, it'll take you to my website. You just type in your email address, click submit, and boom, you got it. So you're probably asking yourself, why are we only talking about 10 objections if there's 21 laid out in this cheat sheet? Well, it's a fair question. The reason why we're gonna narrow the scope down a little bit is because these 10 are the top and most commonly used objections, and they're the most commonly used in front of the jury. So they're super, super important. The other 11, they're either not as common or you're gonna bring them up outside the presence of the jury, typically during emotion motion limine. Perfect example is character evidence. Now, I do wanna address a fun fact, which is, I don't know if you can tell, I had to get on my toes there. I'm wearing my Iron Man shirt in support of Avengers Endgame. We recently saw Avengers Endgame. We loved it, it was fantastic. And truthfully, the 10 years, it's been 10 years, wow, I'm, I'm getting old. The decade basically leading up to this final movie has been absolutely fantastic. It's been a heck of a ride. And, and I've been trying to nerd out basically by incorporating Marvel into one of these Law Venture videos. Some say it couldn't be done, but I'm doing it here. Now, objections are a lot like your sword and your shield. But let's take the sword out and let's use a hammer because Thor is awesome. With objections, they're a great way to keep improper evidence out and basically prevent the jury from hearing things they shouldn't be hearing in the first place. That's where the shield comes in. And they're also a great way to go on the offensive because sometimes the other side gets in a rhythm when they're asking questions, or sometimes the other side just, they're not very good with evidence. So you can throw them off, you can throw a wrench in their plan by objecting at certain points. But my caveat is you need to use your judgment whether or not you're using it as the hammer or the shield because sometimes if you object too much or the way you're objecting may annoy the jury or they may think you're trying to keep evidence out that they should be hearing in the first place. So use your judgment and let's go ahead and dive into number one on this top 10 most common trial objections. Now the first objection is objection leading. And you typically wanna make this objection during direct examination if opposing counsel is asking leading questions during that time through their own witness. And so the reason why you wanna prevent these types of leading questions is because they assume the answers in the question. For example, if I were to ask, you're watching a YouTube video, correct? The answer is yes, or it should be yes, and if you're not paying attention, hey, focus up. And all the witness would have to do in that type of direct examination would be to say yes, 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 yes. That's why it's not allowed. On cross-examination, you can ask all the leading questions you want, well, within reason. And please, please don't make an objection to leading if somebody's on cross-examination. Now, here's where things kind of get a little bit tricky. There's an exception to asking leading questions on direct examination. The exception is if somebody's asking a question that's rel relatively foundational and not super important. So if somebody's trying to get an exhibit admitted, for example, and they ask the leading question, you recognize this document, correct? You probably don't want to stand up and object. Sometimes, uh, certain leading questions on direct examination are allowed or the judge lets it slide just to speed up the process a little bit more when it comes to the non-important stuff. But if the attorney is asking very important questions and those questions are leading, then yes, you do want to object. Now, before you object, you need to make a judgment call, not only with leading objections, but you need to make a judgment call with all objections on whether or not your judge will allow for speaking objections. Now, speaking objections are basically the justification or indirect explanation to the jury about why you're objecting. So you're gonna stand up, look at the judge, and provide your explanation right after you make the objection. And the judge typically and is 99.9% .9 gonna know exactly 
why you're objecting, and exactly what the objection means. And that's not just for leading, that's for all the objections across the board. The reason why you wanna provide that type of justification, typically the judge knows this as well, is because the jury's still listening. And if the jury's listening, they need to know exactly why you're preventing a question, testimony, or answer, or just certain evidence. You don't want the jury to be confused and you don't wanna have the appearance that you're hiding evidence from them be just because you think it's gonna be harmful to your case. If you explain to the jury in a very short sentence that follows the objection, why this evidence is improper or why this evidence is unreliable, then the jury will be on the exact same page as you and you'll maintain that credibility. So if you stand up, make the objection leading, provide that simple justification, say something along the lines of, your honor, opposing counsel is feeding the answer to the witness, I just asked the witness be able to testify, something like that. And the jury typically understands that the witness needs to be the one testifying, not the lawyer. And let's flip the script a little bit. If the other side actually objects to you asking leading questions, then first you need to determine whether or not you actually did. If you didn't, then explain that to the judge. If you did, then you may just wanna own up to it and explain to the judge that you'll open up your questions from this point on. Or third, if you did ask a leading question, but it was just foundational, if it falls under that exception, just explain to the judge and appeal to jud judicial economy that you're trying to just get through uh, some boring parts as quickly as possible so you can get to the meat of the case. And whenever you get to the meat of the case, you'll open up the questions. The judge typically understands that aspect of it and will give you a little bit of flexibility. Not much, but a little bit of flexibility. Okay, so let's move on to the second objection. This second objection is super important. Objection speculation. You never, ever, ever want a non-expert witness to make a guess or to speculate about a fact. That is the job of the jury. And so if you haven't heard any type of foundational testimony or something that establishes that the witness has personal knowledge about what they're talking about, and the witness is just kind of guessing or trying to put the puzzle pieces together for the jury, then you need to object right away. That's absolutely improper because those, those guesses are one, only gonna be relevant when it comes to an expert testimony, but that's mainly the job of the jury. So stand up, object, explain to the judge, which is gonna be your indirect explanation to the jury, that this witness has not laid down the foundation and is guessing. Now, you may want to instruct if the answer has already come out and then you stand up and object. You may want to ask the judge to instruct the jury to disregard that testimony or to disregard that fact. And that's gonna to have to be a judgment call that you make. It may or may not be necessary, but if you wanna be hyper-technical, that may be something you wanna do. Now let's say you're on the flip side to where an attorney objects to speculation to your witness. Well, first determine whether or not it's uh, speculation. If it isn't, then explain to the judge why it isn't. If it is speculation and you realize that, okay, I, I goofed a little bit and I skipped some foundational questions and we weren't able to establish that testimony, explain to the judge that you, you'd be happy to ask those one or two extra questions and that way you can have that type of foundation and then you can go ahead and ask that question again that the attorney was objecting to and because at that point it shouldn't be speculative. Finally, maybe it is speculation. At that point, you may just apologize to the judge, um, ask, you know, to tell your witness, hey, I'm not asking you to speculate or guess. If you don't know, just let me know you don't know. Um, but let's move on to this question and then ask that question. All right, moving on to number three. So with number two, we talked about speculation when it comes from the witness. But with number three, we're talking about objection calls for speculation. You wanna make this objection if you can tell just by the question that's being asked that the witness has no other choice but to guess or to speculate. And so you can basically head off any answer that the witness is going to make. Because the issue is, and you know the saying, you can't unring the bell. If the witness speculates, and even if the judge instructs the jury to disregard the fact, the jury still, still heard it, and the fact is still kinda of out there. So you don't know with certainty whether or not the judge or the jury is actually considering that particular fact or that particular guess or that particular speculation. So if you hear the question being asked and you can tell from the get-go that foundation hasn't been laid that establishes the witness has this personal knowledge, stand up, object, calls for speculation, and then simply explain that this question is going to lead to an answer that is gonna be a guess basically. and 
tell the judge that foundation hasn't been laid that establishes this personal knowledge. Now, let's flip the script a little bit. Let's say that that objection is made to you. Again, you have to determine whether or not it's gonna be proper, whether or not you're asking the witness to speculate or if the foundation has been laid. And if you ended up making a mistake or you try to get, you know, sneak that one past and the lawyer caught you, then you may just say, judge, I can move on and then just ask the following question. Sometimes you can get away with it, sometimes you can't. And if the lawyer calls you out, it's just best to go ahead and move on. Speaking of which, let's move on to number four. Objection hearsay. Number four might be the shortest objection to say, but when it comes to the details behind a hearsay objection, it's an absolute monster. There, one is a question of whether or not this hearsay is non-hearsay, and then there are exceptions out the wazoo. I don't even know if people still say wazoo anymore, but there are a ton of exceptions. And so my recommendation is if you hear the witness talk about what somebody else said, you need to object to hearsay, and you need to put basically the pressure on the opposing counsel to be able to prove one of the million exceptions or whether or not it's non-hearsay. Also, if a document is trying to be introduced by the other side and it has writing from somebody else or out of court statements are being made in that document, then I, again, I recommend that you object to hearsay and you let the other side go ahead and prove why it should be admissible. Truthfully, not a lot of lawyers are very confident in their hearsay knowledge. When it comes to the rule of evidence, and in particular hearsay, they shudder at the idea of having to make a re responsive argument to why something is not hearsay or to why it's an exception. Now, I plan on releasing a video at some point down the road that's gonna break down hearsay a little bit better than I think a lot of people understand it. But as of right now, to keep this video as short as possible, go ahead, look at the hearsay rules, look at the exceptions, and just know that you can actually use the hearsay exception as the Thor hammer offensively by if, waiting until you hear an out of court statement being brought in and putting the pressure on opposing counsel. Now, again, flipping the script, if somebody makes the hearsay exception or the hearsay objection, not exception, then the pressure's on. You need to be able to determine, okay, is this non-hearsay or is there an exception? and then explain that to the judge. The best way to prepare for this is to one, talk to your witnesses and have a good idea about what your witnesses are gonna talk about. And if they're gonna incorporate an out of court statement, then you need to have in your back pocket a response to if hearsay gets brought up as an objection. Also do the exact same thing with all the documents that you're gonna get uh, introduced into evidence. In fact, you should try and get the documents introduced before the trial even begins and see if you can get any stipulations with that as well. But overall, if you're the one who's having to respond to hearsay, you need to open up your rules of evidence book. You need to get your rules of evidence notes out from law school and you need to be, just basically have a refresher course and make sure you're super sound and super comfortable because if they're just objecting to hearsay and they don't really understand hearsay and you have a good response, and then the judge turns back to the people who are objecting and the attorney's like, uh, that's all I got. I, I can only object. I don't really have a response. Then guess what? You're looking real good at that point. All right, enough of that. Let's go ahead and move on to the next objection. The fifth objection is objection asked and answered. This is actually a really common objection that is used mainly whenever your witness is on the stand and opposing counsel is on cross-examination and is floundering or struggling with their cross-examination. If opposing counsel is trying, and this is normally when it happens, if opposing counsel is trying to pin your witness down on a word, on a particular answer, or on a theme, and your witness is just basically using synonymous words, synonymous answers, synonymous themes, like your witness is saying book, but the opposing counsel wants that your witness to say novel, and opposing counsel keeps asking a hundred different ways and keeps getting the same exact answer, and it's a legitimate answer, then you may wanna stand up, you may wanna object, and you may wanna explain that opposing counsel has asked the same question repeatedly different ways and keeps getting the same exact answer and that you ask that um, this court basically instruct opposing counsel to move on, move on and move along. The judge is all about judicial economy, the jury is all about judicial economy and typically that'll get sustained. Now, if your witness is dodging the answer and doesn't really have a good answer and you may wanna actually make the objection knowing that you're gonna lose the objection because 
while you make the objection and maybe have that little bit of a speaking objection, that'll take the attention and that'll take your witness off the hot seat for a brief second. But that brief second can be all the witness needs to come up with a better answer. And then whenever you basically lose the objection, you sit down, the witness has time to become more calm and collected. The question gets asked again, the witness has the answer, boom, you're moving on anyways. Alternatively, if somebody makes that objection to you, one, you need to determine whether or not you got caught, but two, if the witness actually hasn't given a legitimate answer, then you need to explain that to the, to the judge and indirectly explain it to the jury that you're just trying to get the truth to a certain fact and the jury de, you know, deserves to hear this truth. And so, you, you know, say you'll ask it one more time and then you ask that question and if the, if the witness dodges it, the witness isn't gonna look very good in front of the jury. So let, let, the, let the jury you know, scold the witness by determining the witness isn't credible later on. You don't have to always get the answer. So get, ask the question, get the answer, or don't get the answer. Either way, if the witness is dodging, that's gonna be a win-win for you. Okay, let's move on to the next objection. Objection number six is objection relevance. And you need to keep in mind that facts that are being introduced don't have to prove the whole case, don't have to prove a, a substantial amount of the case. A relevant fact just needs to be one brick that's being laid. And after all the relevant facts are laid out, hopefully build a wall. But the issue and the trickiness when it comes to relevance, putting rule 403 and unfairly prejudicial aspects aside, the issue is when you want to object to relevance. Because if you have a hair trigger with the objection relevance, you can come off as a jerk. Let's say opposing counsel on direct examination puts a witness on the stand and is just trying to introduce the witness to the jury and the witness is explaining that she's a teacher, that's her job, that's how she makes a living. And even if that has nothing to do with the case, you don't really wanna object too early on by saying that the fact that she's a teacher is absolutely irrelevant. Instead, wait a little bit, and if opposing counsel sticks on some irrelevant issue for too long, then stand up. But I recommend be a little bit reluctant in your objection. You know, it's a little bit of theater to where you stand up, you, know, you look at the judge and say, Your Honor, I'm sorry, but I have to object to relevance. I was giving opposing counsel some leeway by asking questions about X, Y, and Z. Unfortunately, I feel like we're getting hung up on this issue. I, I just ask that you know we, we move on just for the sake of judicial economy and then sit back down. And then typically the judge is gonna you know agree with you, but if the judge doesn't, then I would just stay seated and wait for opposing counsel to go ahead and move on to the next issue because if they're getting hung up on a certain issue that isn't relevant, then most likely the jury is tuning out. They're not paying attention. Their eyes may or may not be closed, who knows. But if they're not paying attention, whenever the opposing counsel does start talking about relevant facts, they hopefully still aren't paying attention. And that can be a good thing as well. Now, on the flip side, if opposing counsel objects to maybe your question or maybe to your witness saying that certain things are not relevant, then explain to the judge that this is just one brick that's being laid or just explain to the judge that this is just, you know, some type of introductory type of fact so the witness or the jury can get to know the witness or maybe you know bring the theatrics again by you know on, honestly having this reluctant apology by saying your honor i, I apologize i was just wanting uh, uh the jury to understand that you know this witness is a teacher and you know really cares for x y and z and maybe kind of have a little bit of a mini closing argument that explains why this maybe not be relevant, but at the same time, opposing counsel is being a jerk. I don't know, that's a little bit of a rant, that's a little bit of a tangent, but hopefully that makes sense. I think it makes sense. Anyways, moving on to the next objection. Objection seven is objection argumentative. Now you're typically gonna be using this objection when opposing counsel is crossing your witness and opposing counsel is floundering or isn't basically struggling because he or she is no longer asking leading questions but it's almost testifying to where there is no question at the end of each statement that the lawyer is making. They're just statements. And I would maybe wait and hold back on making this objection because lawyers are giving a lot, are given a lot of leeway during cross-examination. A judge isn't quick to sustain a bad question 
on cross-examination, but they will be quick to sustain a bad question on direct examination. So wait until it's obvious or wait until it's clear that your witness is basically being kind of beat up on the stand and then come to the defense of your witness, Avengers Assemble. Uh, sorry, I couldn't resist that one. It just came to me in the moment. But that is a great opportunity if it gets to that much of an egregious nature to basically paint the picture that opposing counsel is beating up on your witness. Juries don't like that. At the same time, if you stand up and make that objection, and maybe it's not a super valid objection at the time, or maybe it is, either way, that will give your witness some time to you know, become you know, more, I guess, you know, cool and calm collected and think about exactly what they're gonna say whenever the spotlight goes back on them. On the flip side, if opposing counsel objects to argumentative, then you can either explain why or why it's not argumentative or just explain to the judge that you'll ask a follow-up question and then basically make the statement and just add a correct at the end of it or add a right at the end of it and you should be kosher and be, be able to move on basically. Speaking of which, let's move on to objection number eight. So thus far, we've talked about a lot of objections that you wanna make to protect your witness whenever your witness is being cross-examined by a lawyer. But this objection, objection number eight, which is objection non-responsive, is most likely gonna be used whenever you're cross-examining a witness and the witness is refusing to give an answer. But you gotta keep in mind, since this is cross-examination, this would be the one objection that comes to mind that the judge isn't gonna give you a lot of leeway on. Because with cross-examination, you have an advantage over the witness because one, you're a trained lawyer, but two, you get to ask leading questions. And so if you're not getting a particular answer from the witness that you're wanting, and you need to use your judgment to where you need to determine, do I just need to ask better questions? Do, do I need to ask more pointed questions? Or is the witness just absolutely dodging this question and refusing to answer this question? Now, there's a little bit of a way to make the witness look really you know, shady and dodgy, but that's, gonna, that's another video that'll take a little bit too much time for the sake of this video. But at some point, if, the, if you get the sense that this witness is just flat out refusing to answer the question, then you need to stand up and say, objection, this witness is being non-responsive. Uh, Your Honor, I, I ask that you instruct the witness to answer the question. Typically, the witness is always like, what's the question? And then be sure to have that question in your back pocket, ask it the exact same way. And then once you ask it, hopefully at that point, the witness is going to answer the question. If not, then the witness is gonna look real, real bad in front of the jury. And that's, that's a win-win situation. All right, that one's super short. Let's go ahead and move on to the next objection. Objection number nine is objection compound. Again, this is one that you're gonna typically make when opposing counsel is cross-examining your witness. And you especially wanna make this when the question assumes basically two facts in the delivery of the question. Here's an example that makes that a little bit clearer. If I were to ask you, if I were to be cross-examining you, you're watching a YouTube video, correct? Th that's one question, that's one fact. If I were to ask, you're watching a YouTube video while sitting down, correct? Now, that's two facts within the same question, and those two facts have yet to be established. And so the issue and the confusion is, okay, if you answer yes, are you answering yes to the fact that you're watching a YouTube video, or are you answering yes to the fact that you're sitting down? Or are you answering yes to both? It's a little confusing for the jury and you wanna make sure all the answers and all the facts are super clear to the jury. So you always, always, always wanna make that objection. That way the record is super clear. Now, if opposing counsel makes that objection to your question, then you typically are gonna to wanna to own up to it because honestly, it's pretty obvious when compound questions are being asked. And then just tell the judge that you'll, you'd be happy to break up the question into two parts. You ask the first question, okay, you're watching a YouTube video, correct? And you follow up, you're sitting down, correct? Boom, you have both facts, you move on. That's not really one you wanna haggle out. So let's go ahead and move on to the next objection. We're on the last objection, objection 10, objection narrative. And how many times did I just say objection? Way too many. So this objection, is most commonly used when opposing counsel is direct examining their own witness. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky objection to make because it's one of those, you, you know it when you see it or you know it when you hear it. 
And it's also tricky because like relevance, you don't wanna have a hair trigger and pull the, you know, the objection on this one too often or too quickly because you run the risk of coming off like a jerk. So my recommendation is if you hear the witness go on a rant or tirade or is no longer answering the question that was asked, then at that point, you, you may want to go ahead and make an objection. Simply stand up, say, Your Honor, I hate to do this, but I'm gonna have to object to narrative. Uh, the witness is no longer answering the question that was asked, so I just ask that opposing counsel be allowed to maybe follow up with another question. At that point in time, the judge, you're appealing to his judicial economy, he's all about that. The jury understands exactly why you're objecting, because if you were to stand up and pull you know, the hair trigger a little bit too quickly, or maybe a minute in, or maybe you know, just only one or two facts into the witness's testimony, the jury may find that very off-put. They may think that you're trying to keep facts or the full story from them, and they, they may not like that. So my recommendation, go ahead, stand up, and you know, be kind of reluctant to make the objection. Overall, these are the top 10 and most common trial objections that you need to have in your back pocket. Use it as Thor's hammer, use it as the shield, and you know that way you can go on the offensive and you can go on the defensive, and you'll be absolutely set for your next trial. And don't forget to download the freebie, which, there we go, got it working. The 21 most common trial objections. It's everything you need. The link is down below. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, leave those in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe. I think that's over here. I'm still trying to get oriented with this whole YouTube thing. Again, my name is Jared Stone. I'll see y'all in the next video.